can you believe we're only halfway through? Whose brains are already being stretched? Who feels like they've had a full day already? A couple of people. I certainly feel like I've had a full day already, uh, but I'm looking forward to the rest as well. Because now we're going to start to talk about one of those tools that we all have in our hands. We've heard it so beautifully put by so many speakers, and I just love the synergies, the way that everyone, everyone's messages are coming together. But there is a tool that each and every one of us possesses if we have, if we have the, the will, and that tool is courage. And so our next two speakers I've invited because of their courage. And I've asked them to tell their stories, and I've asked each of them to tell their stories in ways that they haven't told them before. And it's a challenge for both of them. These are two incredible women, courageous women, but it's also taking a lot of courage for them to come up here and to bear their souls with us in the way that, that they're going to do. The two incredible women that I speak of are firstly Monica Smith, And secondly, former Acting Senior Sergeant Crystal Mitchell. And in my opinion, these two women, along with a number of other fine people from the Battleground Melbourne era in Victoria, are some of the most remarkable people that you will ever meet, and some of the most remarkable pictures of courage that you will ever meet. And I think there's an enormous amount that we can learn. They'll be speaking on courage and what they did, but also on sacrifice on identity, on faith, on conscience. Because God has given each and every one of us a conscience and following that conscience is a part of the task that we have ahead of us. How do you find the courage to do what's right even when your government is wrong? Well, I suggest that you begin by listening to these two incredible women. Would you please welcome Monica Smith. The clicker is just there. Well, the name of my speech is about to come up on the screen, isn't it? Yes, good. Well, there you go. So God is calling us, but are we ready to listen? Now, this talk is um, different and very nerve-wracking for me. It's the first time I've done a talk like this, and it might take you to some dark places. I'm going to go to some really dark places, which I don't usually go to. But I promise there's a reason for it, so you're just going to have to bear with me, all right? Now, um, Topher uh, asked me specifically to talk about my relationship with God before, during, and after, now, um, during everything that I went through. So it's, it's really great because I've done lots, lots of talks, obviously, and um, I always drop God into the mix. You know, I always drop him in there, but <laughs> I've never really had the license to talk only about him or talk only about his impact on me. So if you hate the talk, it's Topher's fault because <laughs> he made me go here, okay? Um, but I'm very blessed to do it. Um, you know, before I do a talk or before I even post anything online and things like that, I always think about how I want people to feel after they read it or after they listen to me talk. And usually... I want people to feel hopeful and happy and joyful and inspired, but um, this talk might not make you feel that way, actually. In fact, I don't know how it's going to make you feel because I've never done it, so maybe you can tell me afterwards. And again, if you hate it, it's Topher's fault. Um, <laughs> I might accidentally force you to think about some things that you don't like thinking about or to confront some mistakes that you don't like thinking about. And I would say sorry but I'm not sorry, because that's the point of my talk, actually. So, sorry, not sorry about that. Um, now, some of you might know me uh, because I went to prison, and if you didn't know, I went to prison. Um, yep, it's my claim to fame, apparently. So, <laughs> I spent 22 days in solitary confinement, not for a crime, but because I refused to sign bail conditions. Now, the bail conditions were basically out of communist China, okay? I actually didn't really have much of a choice to sign it, to be honest, especially the timing, because it was three weeks before mandates and things like that, and they basically just wanted me to shut my mouth. So, um, I went to prison for 22 days, we appealed the bail conditions, we won, and I got out of prison, and I was able to continue doing my work. Like Tofa and like other people, oh, thank you. <laughs> 
So like Topher and many other people, um, it was never about the incitement charges. We all get that now, right? <laughs> because none of them went to trial. They were never going to go to trial. It would have been very embarrassing for the police. It was just about the timing and it was about shutting people up. So you'll, know, you'll understand later why I was able to have the courage to not sign those bail conditions. But you might also know me because I started what some consider a firebrand, whatever that means, Reignite Democracy Australia. Um, and you might remember me running around Victoria with my live stream, basically just annoying the police. Yep, that's what I did. Um, <laughs> maybe I went a bit too far sometimes, but hey, you know, we all figured it out in the end. But you know, we did campaigns and stuff like that. You might know me um, because now I, I'm doing a tour. I've, I've actually done 70 events over 17 countries because I went all over Europe meeting freedom lovers all over the world to understand more about the movement and the family that I think that we're a part of, the freedom family. Um, so that's, that's me now. Um, now, what you don't know is everything that went into becoming this person, um, which, you know, is the dark places that we're going to talk about tonight. Now, you, you might look at me now and think, you know, oh, she looks so confident, you know, she's obviously got her stuff together, you know, she can say what she wants, she, she says what she means, or, or you hate me and you don't know why you're here, but that's fine too. Um, I, <laughs> either way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pretend it's the first one, and, and I appreciate all of that, but, you know, there is a lot more to me than meets the eye, and the reason why I am staunch today is not because I'm special, because anyone can be staunch, the reason I'm staunch is because I know what it's like to live without conviction. I know what it's like to go, <coughs> to go against everything you believe in for years. And I knew this was going to happen. <coughs> and the reason I'm staunch is because I'm trying to make up for it. And I feel like I'm doing that with the work that I'm doing. So um, I have to give you... To again, Topher's fault. He asked me to talk about my relationship with God, so I have to talk about the beginnings, the middles, and the ends. So I have to give you a snapshot of my life. Obviously, the worst parts, because that's the most interesting. <laughs> but anyway, um, if you've read my book, then you know the things I'm about to talk about. If you haven't, you might be a little bit shocked. And I'm not trying to shock you as a gimmick. I'm not trying to be vulnerable as a gimmick. I have a reason for it, and I hope that the reason is clear. So when I started writing my book, I decided to be completely transparent because I don't know what the future holds, and I figured that if I tell all my secrets, then it takes all the power away of other people figuring them out, you know? And when you tell your secrets, actually, surprisingly, they lose their oomph, and you can start to really move through your secrets. It's really, really amazing. You should try it. Maybe not a book, but at least, you know, with your friends and family. But anyway, so um, basically, this is where it gets dark. It's not, we're not going to stay here, okay? But I have to do this. By the time I was 14 years old, um, I had been sexually abused twice. Once was when I was eight years old. The other was when I was 13. And there was more when I was older, but that's the reason I talk about that, and I do talk about it in the book, not in detail, the reason I talk about it is because it actually needs to be spoken about more often, you know, because if your kids or your nieces and nephews or your younger cousins, if they don't have a safe place to talk about these things that happen to their friends or family or to them, who are they going to talk to? And guess who wins when there is silence around sexual abuse? It's the perpetrators. It's never the victims. It took me up until I was about 30 to firstly recognise how bad they were in the first place, but secondly, to start to actually deal with them. There's also the whole families involved, aren't they? And how the parents deal with it is really important for how a victim can get through these things. So my mum has written a chapter at the end of the book talking about how she could have done things differently for me or for herself and how parents can use the information that my mum and me have shared to maybe prepare yourself for these things. And maybe you need to have these conversations with your kids earlier than you think, unfortunately, in a sensitive way. Anyway, um, other than that, I had an amazing childhood. I would never replace anything about my childhood. Well, okay, probably I would. But the point is, is <laughs> my parents were amazing. I went to great schools. I went to great community churches. I was given a moral compass and all of those things. <sighs> 
but somehow I still managed to stuff it up really badly. Obviously, being abused going into the world is not a great place to start, but I was also chubby and chubby chubby, like close to 90 kilos. And when you are a woman who is abused and chubby and you turn 18, 19, 20, ugh, it's a recipe for disaster. And it was. So from 18 to 25, I was just like partying. I was on drugs. I was sleeping around a lot, disrespecting myself a lot. And I don't need to go into details. You can think whatever you want about that. And, you know, actually, now that I think about it, the, the music had a huge impact on me and the culture at the time. It makes women think that it's cool to sleep around, that it's cool to go out clubbing and not know what happened at the end of the night, to black out, ha ha, isn't that so funny? Obviously it's not. I thought I was pretty cool. Obviously we all thought we were cool then, right? But the music that you listen to in the background with your kids, be aware of the actual words that are in there. So I was listening to a lot of R&B music and they talk about women as pieces of meat and I became a piece of meat. And so just be careful of that. I don't blame the music 100%, but I'm just saying it had a huge impact on me. Anyway, so it gets worse. <laughs> um, when, now, I am anti-abortion. I think most people here might be. I don't know how you could be any different, obviously. It's like a life. Um, when I was 16 and 17, I went to pro, uh, pro-life marches. I think it was from Bendigo or Ballarat to Melbourne. It would take three days. And I was, I was anti-abortion. Why? Of course I am, right? Well... Somehow, in those dark times, I somehow convinced myself to have one. Not just one, but two. And it doesn't feel good to not do what you believe in. And even in that moment, I was still anti-abortion. And I always will be. But I convinced myself that, no, what I'm doing now is more important, you know? I was just selfish. All I wanted to do was have fun and be stupid. But deep down, deep down, I knew that one day you're going to have to pay for this. One day you're going to have to pay for it back. And the funny thing is when, it's not funny, wrong word, but the interesting thing is that if you're a mother and you're a good mother, that is your purpose. That's all you need to do, really. You can do other things. Yeah. You can do other things, you can be a part of political parties, you can do all that. But you know that if you do that right, your life is fulfilled. Now, I ruined, I might have ruined that chance, not once but twice. If I had, if I had two children right now, I would have purpose and I wouldn't have to run around the world looking for it, which is what I'm doing right now. You know, people are like, oh, you've got so much energy, this, that and that. It's because I'm trying to fill the void that I created, not because I'm courageous, cor courageous, courageous, but because God told me that you're going to have to make up for this and maybe this is it. Maybe this is me making up for it. Maybe I'll ne I, don't think I, I don't think you can actually ever make up for murdering people, but I'm going to try my hardest anyway. So when things started to turn around for me was actually a really bad situation. Um, I was living in Sydney. I had a bad boyfriend at the time. And I got drugged at a work Christmas party. Sounds terrible, obviously, but it ended up being the best thing that ever happened to me because I was so embarrassed. I didn't know what happened. I didn't know who did it. And so I moved back home with my parents in Melbourne and I just started going back to church because I had nothing better to do. And <laughs> within like three years, it took, me, it took me a while. I was flirting with my old life a little bit back and forth. It took me a while but it took me about two to three years to become the person that I'm really proud of today. And I, obviously, God owes us nothing. He gave us everything already. He, he owes us absolutely, he doesn't owe us a second chance. But for some reason, he saw me as a second chance. He gave me a second chance. And because of that, he expects a lot from me. So that's pretty much why I'm uh, staunch the way that I am. Oh, wow, I've already gone through the whole first page. I didn't even have to look at it. Isn't that great? <laughs> anyway, um, my redemption story really starts at 29. So talking about running around looking for my purpose to fill the void, um, I started traveling solo and I just did random things like interviewed random people and I just put myself into weird situations to grow and I was looking for purpose and I said to God, 
look, maybe I've ruined my chance at motherhood. Maybe, maybe you're going to punish me and you're never going to let me have a family. And if you do that, that's fair. That's fair. And maybe I need another purpose. I need to give up my life for people or charities or things like that. But you need to tell me what. <laughs> like, please help me out here. I'm just traveling the world being, you know, crazy trying to figure it out. So I said to him one night, I was laying in, I had a bed in the back of my minivan in the United States. And I remember laying there thinking, just, just tell me what I'm supposed to do. And I promise I'll work my butt off to do what you ask. And, you know, I prayed too hard, obviously, because um, I really got that message. But before I got that message or the other messages I'm about to talk about is it's, it's easy to ask for God's voice. But how do you know when it's him? How do you know if it's the right voice? How do you know if it's not ego? How do you know if it's not the devil? It can be hard to decipher it. So I was like, how do I know what's going on? So he gave me this story. Um, I was driving in the Northern Territories. It was the middle of the night. It was three o'clock in the morning, okay? No cars, no street lights, nothing. I was driving alone, as, as I usually am. And um, I had this random thought in my head to beep the horn. And I said to myself out loud, well, why would you do that? That's stupid. And then I was like, well, I've got nothing to lose. I'll beep the horn. Beep, beeped the horn, came around the corner, and this massive kangaroo just hopped past my car. Oh, I was like, obviously I wasn't drinking or anything, guys. I was driving, okay? I pulled over and I just, and it just hit me like a ton of bricks. God told me, I am speaking to you. You just have to listen. You have to decipher it and you have to trust me. And if you want to listen to me, then you actually have to. If I tell you something you don't want to hear, you have to listen anyway because you've asked for this. So um, at this point, I've given my reins of my life over to God. What could, what could possibly go wrong, right? Okay, that's great. Uh, thank you. Okay, so now August 2020, this is uh, four months of lockdowns, of course, in the, in, the, in the worst lockdown place in the world. And this is August 2020 is when anyone who was going to easily wake up was awake because, come on, brothels were open and churches were closed. Like, which one is more intimate? Like, come on, it's stupid. But that's just one example. There's so many other examples. So I started Reignite Democracy Australia. I had no idea what it was going to turn into. I uh, no, had no idea what was in store for me. But what became very evident, especially now, is that I was training three years prior to that for this moment, or for that moment, and for this moment, actually. I was traveling the world, learning about myself and the world, so that I could do exactly what I did. So, I started RDA, whatever, whatever. Okay, so, then prison. You guys know what happened with prison. Let me, now, again, and I appreciate the compliments. I mean, every human being likes compliments, okay? But... And if they say they don't, then they're just lying. But anyway, I love the compliment, you're courageous. It's great, it's nice. But let me explain to you what actually happened. And then you can tell me what you think about my decision. So, three days before I was arrested, given bad bail conditions, didn't sign them and went to prison, I had a dream that I was arrested, given bad bail conditions, didn't sign them, went to prison, and I was fine in my dream. Three days before. Second, it was so vivid that I even told people about the dream. Two days after that, well, actually three days after that, I was at Dr. Ian Brighthope's house and um, doing an interview with him about vitamin D, which you guys heard about recently already. But um, I made a joke to him as I left his house and I said, look, Ian, if, if I go to prison or something, make sure you keep doing interviews because, you know, we really need this message. I drove out of his driveway and got arrested. So it was, like, it was like already set up for me and all I had to do was relax and enjoy the ride, more or less, basically. So when I got arrested, I was like, oh, oh, the dream. Oh, right, okay. So God literally told me what was going to happen and told me that I had to do it and told me that it was going to make an impact and told me that I was going to be fine. Did I have a choice? No. Not only that, I was in remand, and this is the night before you go to prison, so it's not comfortable at all, obviously, it's prison. But anyway, I was in a cell on my own, but I could hear this lady in the other cell, and she was screeching and squealing. I've never heard a human being act like this in all my life, not even on a movie. And I know for sure that that was the devil. 
And he was telling me, you can't do this. Who do you think you are? You're just one little girl. You just want attention, because I am partial to attention. You just want to be a hero. You just want everyone to think that you're courageous and stuff like that. And I'm like, well, yeah, I do want that, but God told me what to do, so I've got no choice. And I was like yelling back at this woman. It was um, quite the spectacle, to be honest. But anyway, um, I knew what I needed to do, and I just did it. Now, on top of that, guys, I have no young children, obviously. You know that already. And I had nothing to lose. I had hardly anything to lose. So it really, I was the right person for the job. Now, my relationship with God in prison, he gave me peace. He gave me so much peace that I was actually fine in there. I mean, I'm not a robot. It wasn't great, but it was fine. And God gives you that gift of peace to tell you that you've done the right thing. And to tell you that, hey, living with conviction has its ups and downs, but it's not as bad as when you did it last time, is it? This time, you're making me happy. And for that, I'm going to give you peace, which is obviously, oh, didn't need that either. Um, So that was prison. I'm going to talk about my relationship with God now. Um, So it's kind of a funny relationship because I actually am alone a lot. I'm traveling around Australia at the moment. I'm alone in my car. And I actually, and it's funny because I'm a Catholic and Catholics tend to be a little bit, you know, more about the whole sin and hell thing. And they don't really talk to God much (laughs) sometimes. But I've gotten gotten the the knack for this. And so I do talk to God. And so I have two court cases coming up, for example. One in which I could go back to prison, but (laughs) that would be funny if they did that. Volume number two. Um, (laughs) I don't think they would do that. But anyway, there's a punishment associated with it. The other case is I'm actually suing Victoria Police. It's going to be the first time. Yeah. Because I don't need to take a deal, guys, because I have the support of my family and friends and things like that. So I can go all the way and I can't wait to do that. But I could lose it all. If I lose, I'm going to get a cost order against me and it's going to be pretty bad for me. But you know what? With God on your side, I just don't see how you can lose. And if you're following your conviction, even if you're a little bit staunch, I still don't see how you can lose. So this is what happens. I go into church and I'm sitting there with my, my, my brain and I, I'm like, oh, do we have to do that? Yes, Monica, we do. I promise it's going to be fine. Just, just, just you do that and I'll deal with the rest. I'm like, oh. Fine. It's kind of like I'm a teenager and he's my dad and I'm like, do we have to do this? And look, I, the thing is, is that when God wants me to move on, I'm going to move on. Trust me. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for that call. Um, that hasn't quite come yet. But as soon as, as, as long as he wants me to keep doing this, I'm going to keep doing this. And the only reason I do it now, everything, everything I say like, oh, I did this or I made this decision, I just want to make it really, really clear that we are just vessels. We are just bodies. Yes, and if God wants me to collapse right here on the ground, he will let me do that because every skill, every character, every good deed you have done, every good thought you have is all from God, not from you. And if you remember that, it's going to help you with your ego. And there's a lot of people in the room here with platforms, with messages. And trust me, if you remember that you are nothing and God gave you everything, it's really going to help you with your ego and help you work with other people. So I wanted to say that. So I'm going to finish and I'm going to actually read this part because I just don't want to get any part of it wrong. So I want you to leave on just a few key topics, uh, key points that I've already made, but I'm just going to make it again for you, okay? Number one, learn how to hear when God calls. You know exactly what I mean. You've heard it all before. It can be small or big, public or private. It doesn't matter. Don't compare your calling to other people because we're all different and we all have different lives. It's not the same. If we all did what we were called to do, we probably wouldn't have to have conferences like this. Sorry, Tofa. I know you love doing them. But if, uh, if we were doing what we were told, we wouldn't have to be here. God is calling you to do something for him, not for yourself, not for glory, not for ego. You've just got to trust the process and have faith in his plan. Sometimes we fool ourselves by pretending we want to listen to God's voice, but then he, tell, he says something and you try to ignore it, and that's stupid because he knows you heard it. So if you really want to hear it, you've got to be truly open to it. And if you are, you must also be prepared to listen when it comes, which I already said, sorry. If you do listen to the calling, you will be rewarded. 
with purpose and fulfillment, even if there's pain on the way. Number two, none of your achievements are yours. I just said that. I'm not going to say it again. Number three, sexual abuse needs to be more spoken about. Sorry, it's awkward, but you just have to. Number four, regardless of your past mistakes, use my story as an example. I don't know if there's anything worse you could possibly do in life. Um, everyone is worthy of redemption, but you have to step into your calling and forgiveness will follow. Not straight away, but maybe on your deathbed. I don't know. Anyway, number five, standing by your convictions always works out in the long run. Um, so just have faith and stick to it. So hopefully this works. Oh, yeah. So when I was in prison, I came up with this uh, quote. During times of psychological warfare, collective courage of conviction will be our strongest weapon. So when that time comes, remember how important your conviction is. Now, everyone in this room is a step above, a step ahead, not in a special way, but you're a step ahead because you're here, Right. But it's now your job to actually live that conviction so others can see it. Not speak about it. Live it in practice, not in theory. Theory means nothing. And there is no grey area in conviction, let me tell you. If you're pro-life, you're pro-life. Not up to three months, not up to six months or whatever it is. Find your conviction and stick with it because other people are watching you especially. And they want you to follow your conviction. So make a choice. Listen to the call, be humble. Listen, um, I'm going to say that again because I like this last bit. <laughs> Make a choice, listen to the call, be humble, find your conviction and live with purpose. And God is calling us and we are going to be ready to listen.